Okay, so we are ready to roll. So this is our second Meraki Quarterly, and we've got an exciting update for you today from all four of our product managers uh, here at uh, headquarters in San Francisco. And our focus is going to be on making sure we've got you up to date with the latest and greatest from uh, Cisco Meraki. And so here we go. So the quarterly is the concept, if you're, if you're joining us for the first time, is that we want to take you through once a quarter to establish what is actually a new and current with uh, the Meraki portfolio. And so we want to break that down into the four key components of the portfolio. Uh, we have uh, got an order today of Wireless First, then we will go into an update on our MDM product systems manager. Uh, we'll then go into switching and wrap things up at the end with uh, the security appliances. We'll also have an opportunity, I'm sure, for a few questions uh, to be shared with you all towards the end of the hour. Uh, but do please use the Q&A during the session. We'll do our best to keep on top of those questions. Uh, but obviously, if we are unable to answer them all today, then we can always catch up with you at a later date. OK, so without further ado, I'd like to hand things over to Matt, who's going to take us through his wireless update. Thanks, Simon. Just a quick diversion. We're also doing a, a video recording as well. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't have notice of this ahead of time because I had intended us all to wear carnival masks. So uh, we'll, we'll see if we can get the uh, live video recordings out in the future, but right now you'll just have to do with audio. At least we have the pets, the dog helps. The pets and the attempt to uh, replace the dog and pony show with at least a real dog is certainly underway. So getting started with wireless. Uh, last time we talked a bit about the growth of the 802.11 AC market and how the uh, penetration of that technology has been proceeding compared to 802.11N. This time I want to take a, a moment to talk a little bit about the enterprise wireless LAN market in general. Uh, here we are in 2014, of course it's roughly a $5 billion market today at the end of the year. And we're seeing uh, through 2015 all the way up to 2018 a uh, healthy 10% compound annual growth rate. So this is very much a, a strong piece of the network technology market. Uh, the, all the reasons that we talked about for .11 AC adoption apply to the overall market growth uh, in terms of the explosion of BYOD devices, increasing the uh, load and demand in the wireless network, as well as the uh, foresight of enterprises to try and future-proof their networks. Of note now uh, is the fact that cloud managed wireless LAN is being tracked by IDC as a uh, subset of this market, which uh, is exciting because of course technology isn't real until an analyst starts tracking it. So now we know this is real technology. Of course, Meraki has been in this business for many years now. And so it's exciting because the growth rate that uh, they're showing for this piece of the wireless LAN market is uh, much stronger, 30% compound annual growth rate. Uh, Meraki has a very strong dominant position in the cloud managed wireless LAN market. We all know this. This is um, thanks to all of the, your hard work out there. And to me, the most exciting piece is that uh, we find that the, distinguish, the, the distinction between a cloud managed wireless LAN market and the enterprise wireless LAN market is really unnecessary. The Meraki full network stack and the cloud managed wireless solutions specifically uh, are fit for all applications, for all enterprise use cases. They're not limited to some small subset of the market. We've been seeing continuous growth in the, the applications and customer demand for these solutions. So this is very exciting for us to track. So let's talk a little bit more about Bluetooth and beacons. Uh, this was uh, introduced again last quarter. And uh, again, Bluetooth Low Energy is a, a new form of wireless technology that's used for some very interesting location trends. And we've integrated it into the MR32 and 72. And I won't talk about these devices specifically, but I will run through what the basic beacon workflow looks like very quickly because we did this last time. But then I want to get into some specific examples of use cases. So to start out, you have an AP with an integrated beacon that's deployed in some location. And that beacon is configured to indicate that location. You have a user who enters into that contextual location. They have on them a smartphone. And that smartphone hears the beacon. And that smartphone, an app on that smartphone, is able to respond to that beacon. Initially through maybe an indication in the bottom left corner of the lock screen called the hero icon. It's the app letting the user know that there's uh, something that the app can do relevant to that location. 
And then that user might open up that app. Uh, in this case, it's a, an example of a restaurant app that would open. Finally, on the back end, when that app is able to interact with the user and make some sort of decisions based on knowledge of the location, that can generate all kinds of back end opportunities for collecting information, for storing into some sort of a back end system, and allowing the, uh, the retailer, the developer of the app, the uh, deployer of that, uh, of that beacon technology to put together a much broader view of how their users and individual users are making use of this service. Let's look at a few examples. The first one uh, might be a corner bank, a notional banking service. And banks are great because most of us probably have at least one banking app on our phone, if not two or three. And uh, in general, the penetration of smartphone app uptake for banking is very high. So this is a great opportunity for the, uh, the, end, so the retailer in this case, or the, the bank, to make use of Beacon technology because their end users already have the app. What sort of things could they do with this app? Well, for example, they could deploy a wireless network in their branches. They could configure their beaconing system. They could set their app up to understand those beacons. When the smartphone, when the user with the smartphone, with the app, walks into a branch, the app will recognize the beacon. It will look up the location and identify what services are available. And it can notify the user, for example, that the, uh, there are notary publics or that there's an invent a personal financial advisor available at this branch and give them an opportunity to maybe connect with those resources. So this is uh, just another opportunity for the bank in this case to re-engage with the user, to uh, provide some sort of dynamic context and to help them uh, enjoy their experience much more than they would have otherwise. Another quick example is uh, the notion of re-engagement. So you might have a big box retailer that has an e-commerce strategy and they might know that you are online on their website, you've been browsing, selecting some, some items, putting them in your cart, and then you walk away from your computer. This is a huge problem with online e-commerce. One of the benefits of a physical presence of having a brick and mortar store is that you might have an opportunity to close that loop. So you might have an ordering app on your phone, and many of these uh, retailers do have such apps. They let you also place orders and, uh, and pay for them. And so they could tie this app in with your online profile with their e-commerce site and detect that you've abandoned a cart and maybe even offer, because you've walked into a particular location and they know that that inventory is available, they can give you the opportunity to finish that transaction, pick up your items, and continue on your way. Overall, creating a better experience for the end user and providing the retailer the opportunity to increase their sales. So with this, I just want to give a couple of quick dashboard updates. It's only been a quarter since the last update, so there's not a whole lot new to talk about, but I do want to review. First of all, there's a new set of uh, documentation on the AutoRF algorithms, which includes the uh, transmit power control channel, uh, mag channel settings, and that's available on our new documentation website, which you can find at documentation.rocky.com. A lot of you have had questions about uh, some of this, uh, some of the logic behind how this works. Also, I'd like to point out that uh, along with the new AutoRF functionality, we have introduced some visibility into what the automatic channel selections and the automatic transmit power selections are. Uh, you have to, of course, be on the beta code in order to see this functionality today. Uh, we're looking to turn that into a generally available release soon, and this will be visible on your dashboard, uh, the radio settings pane. Along with that, we have also made the ability to set the 5 gigahertz channel widths a uh, default setting. It's uh, not something that we have to enable special anymore. It's something that you can, uh, you and your users can do on their own. And so with that, I will pass the ball, the metaphorical ball, over to Paul with an MDM update. Fantastic. Thank you for that. I really wish that I could share a photo of Matt right now with his dog. I think I really like this. Definitely a lot more than I like the picture of me up there. So let's, change, <laughs> let's move that. All right, well, how's it going, everybody? My name is Paul Wolf. I'm on the product team here with, uh, on Systems Manager. So I think one of the most exciting things that happened for us this last quarter is our update to our structure of Systems Manager. <clears throat> so if you back up to before uh, March 24th, we basically had two product lines. We had Systems Manager Standard, which had a basic feature set, had MDM functionality, you could do some menial things like you push apps and the, you had the dashboard and you had a lot of things around that. And we also had Systems Manager Enterprise that allowed you to use some more advanced feature sets, some 
dynamic provisioning, a lot more security rules, data control, stuff of that nature. And what we did on March 24th is we actually streamlined both of these products and we made just the new systems manager. We've made this, uh, we've simplified it and this makes it so that all new customers will get all of the functionality of systems manager across the board. So here's how that looks. We have a uh, systems manager. If you create an organization, you create your systems manager network. It is actually still free if you have under 100 devices, if you have 100 devices or less. And then if you have over 100 devices, then you can purchase a license for those. And as was the case before, um, there's no phone support on the under 100 device not licensed product, but all of the feature sets are included now. And we're actually very excited about that part of it. One of the major reasons that we went after this new model was so that we could provide all of this rich functionality and the enterprise functionality to more customers. So this is making it so all of our new customers will have all of those enterprise features um, and that's going to be for everyone moving forward. The other thing that we've done with this is we have this case where we have a lot of existing systems manager standard customers. So what's very exciting to talk about with that is that nothing changes for you unless you want it to. So basically you have everything that you've had. You have the same case with system manager standard that you had before. You have the features that you have. Phone support is not included, but you can continue to add devices to your network. You can continue to use that as it was. But the second thing that I'm very excited about that is that we have promotional offers available from now until June. So we definitely recommend reaching out because that's exceptional pricing that we're offering because we've really, the major reason why we've done this push and the new model is to one, simplify it so that there's not two models. You have to have these feature tables and look at what is included, what isn't included. And the other one is because we want to provide this functionality to more of our customers. All right, so why do you want Systems Manager? If I have, we have about 10 minutes each here. So if I have to give you an overall breakdown of why you want Systems Manager and what's in some of this new rich functionality, here's probably how I would break it down for you. So for one, the overall high level is that you want complete security and automation. So the picture that Systems Manager can paint for you now is let's say you have this device that comes onto the network. This could be an Android device, maybe it's a tablet, maybe it's your Mac computer. This case will say that it's an iPhone. Comes onto the network, you're prompted to enroll into Systems Manager, and then we pull a lot of information automatically from that. When you're prompted to enroll, we can say, what is your username and password? We put in Steve, put in your credentials for that. Based off of that, we can talk to directory services automatically. That's stuff like Active Directory, LDAP, maybe you're using Open Directory. And from that, we can tell what kind of user this is. So we say it's Steve, he's a member of the corporate group. And then we can also do security compliance check on that device. So in the case where it was an iPhone, you wanna be making sure that it doesn't have, it's not jailbroken, or if it's Android, maybe it's not rooted, or disk encryption is on there, or passcode is in, uh, applied stuff of that nature you'd want to make sure was on the device while you're doing your security posture. So in this case, Steve came on, we know he's a member of corporate, he's in security compliance, so we can actually apply everything to that device. We can apply the network policies and then also settings and all this configuration. So if you look here on the left, you can see since he's a member of corporate and in security compliance, we pushed out email settings that already have his email username injected into it. Uh, you can force encrypted backup. You can put some restrictions on the device based on that user. You push down VPN settings that allow you to automatically connect to an MX appliance or whatever is concentrating your VPN. You can enforce passcode, all of these things, as well as push out enterprise apps, files, documents. Uh, we do have a file sync and all of that kind of functionality. And the other exciting piece of that is that you can apply network access settings directly. So let's say you're looking at the rest of the Meraki hardware stack, for example. What we would do is we can, we can take that, we know he's a corporate user, we know he's in security compliance, so we would apply the group policy that allows him to connect to all of our corporate resources. So now Steve's on the, on the network, he can print, he can access the local file server, he has his specific content filter rules, maybe bandwidth limitations, something like that, that it should be for a corporate user. So the other exciting part about this is that not only do we fully automate the security and the access and all the settings that push down on the device, but you can actually take, um, take effect on the device and the network policies if they're, say, violating. 
So let's say that now that iPhone comes up as maybe they removed a passcode or maybe maybe it's jailbroken, something of the sort there. So we pick up on that. We can remove the Exchange server. So we're pulling off our corporate email off there, pull off the VPN off of that, removing those enterprise apps and documents. You're also affecting the network access directly as well. So now maybe they can't talk to other wireless clients. They can only get out to remediation websites. You can make sure that the data is secured because we pulled it off that device and you also protect your network. So you can see there, this is limiting access to other parts of your network where a majority of, uh, a big part of breaches that have happened over the last couple of years have actually been due to uh, mobile devices and things like jailbreak and from them being compromised. So we can actually immediately take effect on that device. Make sure that we uh, help you with data loss prevention, pull off your credentials, your emails, and also directly apply the network access. So it's a very, very powerful story that you can tell now. So you can also do dynamic assignment. Of course, not everybody's gonna be the same kind of a user. So you can actually set up rules just by checking a couple boxes or adding tags, true Meraki fashion, um, to say, let's say someone else comes on. So maybe Bobby comes on with his device. We know that he's not a member of, of corporate, but maybe he's a guest or a BYOD user, maybe consultant, something of the sort. So we do a couple things with that. One, they're gonna be in a different group. So we're gonna look at that. And two, based off of them being in a different group, maybe you have a different security policy. So in this case, maybe we're not forcing them to have a passcode. Maybe you're only checking for jailbreak detection. You're not searching desktops for firewall or disk encryption or anything like that. So you would want to automatically look at the group and the security compliance. You would want to have a different posture assessment. So similar to before, now you would apply different settings automatically. And again, this is administrators don't have to go in, manage these devices and say, here's the Wi-Fi settings you want, here's the productivity apps, here's the specific things. We're doing all that work for you. We can push out a different set of applications because maybe it's a consultant or a student in a different grade, something of the sort there, and then apply the network access accordingly. So they can get out to the internet, maybe they do or don't have access to printers, you can push out specific Wi-Fi settings. Maybe you still want some WPA2 enterprise Wi-Fi settings to come down with certificates and things that we can fully automate. Um, it really becomes a very, very compelling story when you, with Systems Manager, when you can bring those endpoints directly into your network access and all of that accordingly. All right. And we are ready for Lawrence. All right, I'm going to try to get to my spot without running over the dog. Yeah, come on over. <laughs> my turn with the dog. Oh, Joe's got the dog. All right, so good morning, everyone. So unlike Paul, I actually do like this picture of me, so hopefully you guys <laughs> do as well. Uh, but again, my name is Lawrence Wong. I'm the product manager for the Meraki MS Switch line. Uh, so today, I just want to go over some of the recent updates, but uh, kind of just talk about a market update. So the last time we talked, we saw that the market was transitioning. A couple of years ago, the whole idea of cloud management uh, was still interesting to many people. But I think as uh, you know, we've clearly shown cloud management is not just a niche, but it is a different type of consumption model and way to manage your network. Um, you know, some of the things that we've seen happen in the past couple of months, as many of you guys know, is that HP announced their intent to acquire Aruba. I think what this says to me is that some of the trends at the edge that we've been seeing, uh, you know, the order that I had before changes, specifically things like unified wireless and wire management becomes even more important. It's something that we and our customers have recognized, but I think the industry is coming around to this fact uh, with things like the announcement uh, between HP and uh, Aruba. I think, you know, as we see that the world is becoming a wireless first world in many different types of enterprise deployments. The foundation for that still is a strong foundation built on wired networking. So things like ease of use, being able to support uh, technologies like 802.11ac uh, seamlessly uh, are important for many of our customers. And I think the other thing that Meraki has shown uh, you know, that uh, customers uh, used to struggle with is visibility. Specifically, understanding what's actually happening on your network understanding what type of traffic and applications and how clients are flowing, understanding where noisy devices are. This type of visibility integrated into dashboard is immensely powerful because as a network admin, now you can start making intelligent data-driven decisions, whereas before it used to be, 
a shot in the dark or you used to have to combine many different solutions together to get the type of visibility that Meraki provides out of the box. Now, specifically, what have we been up to? Well, this is kind of a snapshot of the past year or so of Meraki MS features. The way I like to think about this is if you actually look at the top half, you'll notice these are very traditional network-centric type of features, and that's okay. And these are things that you know we, we know are important to continue to develop and add to our product line because at the end of the day, at the foundation, these are networking products. But for us, what gets us really excited are things in the bottom half, things on the green line. These are features that we view as our differentiators uh, to really set us apart uh, from the competition, to make it easier for you to sell the Meraki full stack. Yes, we're talking about each of our individual products today, but again, it really is about it's better together. How do all the pieces integrate? How do you extend that visibility from the client with EMM, Enterprise uh, Systems Manager, all the way up to the switches, access points, uh, MX security appliance up to the internet. So some of the things that we recently added from a pure networking perspective include isolated ports, um, <clears throat> which I'll go into in a little more detail, uh, as well as things like network topology and ethernet power reporting. So what exactly is this? Well, when it comes to energy reporting, this is again, enhancement of extending the existing visibility that we have uh, with the Cisco Meraki switch line. So many of our customers love using time-based ports, which is a feature that allows you to configure policies to determine when ports are turned on or off. <clears throat> what this allows a customer to do is to determine, uh, you know, to save energy and to enhance additional security by making sure that devices that should be off after certain hours are. Now, of course, this is great, but we wanted to provide customers a way to visualize what this actually looks like. <clears throat> so what we've done in our summary report is to add this new Ethernet power uh, reporting. So now you can see in this example, you can see power rate over time. And so this is an example of a customer that does use uh, time-based ports, and you can clearly see uh, the, you know, the power change over the course of uh, days and weeks. Now, the nice thing here is it shows you things like the average power consumed, the minimum, the maximum, as well as the minimum. Uh, but of course, the things like the top switches that actually consume that power you can actually go into the details of those specific switches and in fact, go deeper into seeing uh, on a given port, on a given switch level, what devices are consuming the most power. So again, additional visibility brought to you by you know, the power of uh, Meraki in terms of our architecture, the visibility that we provide built into our platform. So next up, isolate ports, guest mode. Again, this is more of a network centric feature the way we think about this is this is really geared towards hospitality deployments. Uh, so uh, many of you guys who sell into hospitality, uh, you know, type of customer networks, you know that, for example, in hotel deployments, uh, oftentimes you may have, you know, one to several switches on a given floor and each of those switch ports may go to power up access points, but they may also go to a individual room. Typically, the way these things are deployed is that you will define the same access VLAN across the board. Now, of course, that's not the greatest thing. All these clients in different rooms are in the same broadcast domain. So what this feature does is allow you to keep that type of configuration, but what it does is it prevents clients in these individual uh, rooms, in this example, from being able to talk to each other, but they can talk uh, in and out uh, to and from the internet. So it's again, a simple way uh, to secure uh, this type of deployment uh, with Cisco Meraki switching. Now, last but certainly not least, one of the other features that we added recently is network topology. So network topology is truly a unique end-to-end -end view uh, of your network. It's automatic device discovery. And on top of that, what this means is beyond traditional static deployments of this, where you may create this by pen to paper or, or by using Visio, this is you know, a topology that is auto-generated every time you log in the dashboard. So it's up to date, uh, provides you real-time status information of the devices, and this is powered by Cisco Meraki switches. Why do I say that? Well, the reason I say that is because of the visibility and the type of data and statistics uh, that we can aggregate and filter on. Maybe it's device state, maybe, maybe it's uplink state, port status, spanning tree state. This type of information is aggregated and filtered and parsed through intelligent algorithms 
to build this network topology feature. And the best part is if you have other non-Meraki devices, maybe you have existing uh, Catalyst deployments uh, connected to Meraki switches, you can see the details there as well. Of course, as a partner, one of the interesting things about this is that you can actually export this to Visio or import this into Visio. So if you're helping your customer build out additional parts of this network uh, diagram, maybe you want to add the part with their data center, their core network, you can easily do so as well. And of course, if you want to find out more details, we do have a white paper on this technology uh, that you can read uh, more about to understand the technology and uh, you know, all the benefits behind it. So with that, I'm going to transition to my friend Joe here, who's going to give you an update on the MX security appliances. Yeah, Joe. Ooh. Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you happen to be at the moment. <clears throat> I also don't love my picture, so we're going to skip right past that, just to follow the trend that Lawrence broke. Um, <laughs> So let's talk about the MX security appliance for, for a few minutes here. Uh, first things first, we've seen phenomenal growth. We actually had our best quarter in the history of the product and our fiscal quarter too. Um, we, you know, obviously, you guys are in large part to thank for that, so we appreciate all your hard work. Uh, <clears throat> I think a big part of that, as Lawrence said, really comes in around the value of the full Meraki stack. So I, I kind of want to emphasize and just reiterate that it's not just about selling MX, MS, MR, Systems Manager, although Paul, I'm sure, would say it's mostly about selling Systems Manager. Almost entirely. Um, but I think it's important to realize that, you know, going back into existing accounts that have one part of the portfolio and going back in and saying, you can manage the same, you know, do the same thing with your security, you can do the same thing with your switching, you can do the same thing with your enterprise mobility management is a huge part of what has shown us growth in the kind of three younger product lines, right? Taking us from a leader in wireless to being a full cloud managed portfolio that is recognized as you know, the leaders in cloud managed networking rather than the leaders in cloud managed wireless. So again, a lot of that great work has been done on your side of the fence, so we really appreciate that. So I wanna talk about just a couple of things today in terms of MX updates. The first one, as most of you are hopefully aware, uh, we've released the MX64 and MX64W fairly recently. These are replacement units for the old MX1660W. They'll be replacing them in the, in the lineup. And there are a couple of really cool things about these products. One is that they are two to three times the speed and performance of the 1660W. Uh, we really have you know, put in extra effort to make sure that we see a drastic performance increase. And the reason we've done that is that we've seen that the trend uh, in branch networking is that branches now in the era of guest networking and in the era of cloud applications have a much higher bandwidth usage need than they did even five years ago, much less 10 years ago. So when you look at branch networking, it used to be about connectivity to headquarters. It used to be a point of sale for retail. It used to be about very specific things. Now branch networking may have almost the same demands as corporate networking at this point. So it's important to address that need, and that's really why we felt that we wanted to build a robust hardware platform that not only had the throughput capabilities to address that, but also had uh, the kind of platform capabilities to support new features we want to build going forward, really build ourselves a future-proof platform that we can use to do new and exciting things um, that I won't talk about today, but that I <laughs> promise you are coming in typical Meraki fashion. Um, the other piece of this that I really love is that the MX64W is a drastic step forward in terms of wireless from the MX60W in two ways. One is it's simultaneous dual band. So unlike the 60W where you can only do 2.4 or 5 gigahertz uh, either or, on the 64W we do simultaneous dual band, you can do both, and it's 802.11 AC. And I've actually been using uh, a 64W myself when I travel and I've seen phenomenal range and phenomenal performance out of the wireless. It's actually the same wireless chipset that's used in the MR32, and we're quite proud of it. So uh, I wanted to mention that. Of course, this ties into our existing story of being the, you know, the retail branch UTM or the general branch UTM for distributed deployments, and we think this is a great addition to the portfolio for that use case. And we also are working on uh, even more kind of PCI documentation for specifically retail, but really any financial sensitive uh, customer that we'll be releasing soon that will have details about how to build a perfect Meraki cloud managed branch. 
So keep an eye out for that. The other thing I want to talk about today is IWAN. Um, some of you may be familiar with IWAN. It's sort of, I would say, equal parts, uh, a very powerful kind of marketing repackaging of existing technologies, as well as evolution of some of the existing Cisco technologies to build a new technology platform that is designed around the idea that your network should be smarter. Your network should be intelligent enough, and actually the I in IWAN stands for Intelligent WAN, that it should adapt to changing network circumstances. It should know what to do. It should be able to make certain fundamental traffic and pathing decisions based on the current state of the network, rather than requiring you to go in and make a bunch of manual changes. Um, and as you might be thinking as you hear this, this is something that fits in very well with kind of the Meraki model, right? So we felt that it made sense for the MX to be part of this IWAN story. The IWAN team um, has been phenomenal at Cisco at kind of working with us on that. And if you look at these, these slides we have in front of us, there are four what we call pillars of IWAN. And I think historically we've always done very well in the application optimization and secure connectivity pieces between our built-in ABC, our quality of service, our bandwidth optimization, right, all of that, and our auto VPN technology. So what we're focusing on in an upcoming release that'll be out this summer are pillars one and three. So for transport independence, we've been doing this to some extent. The difference is uh, very similar to IWAN on the ISR, what we're going to do is we're going to overlay our auto VPN tunnels over existing methods of communication, things like MPLS, you know, broadband, cellular, whatever it happens to be, in order to kind of abstract out the physical medium or abstract out the type of connection you have and make it nice and clean and just say it's a path, right? All we care about is it is a secure path. And from that, we can do a lot of interesting things. So that's where you get into distributing traffic between multiple VPNs over an MPLS or an internet circuit, over cellular and MPLS, all these things. And really that tails into the third pillar, which is intelligent path control. And this is the kind of the key functional difference in what we're building is that we're building performance and policy-based routing into the MX platform. And what I mean by that is you'll be able to do things like specify certain types of traffic that should take a particular path over the VPN. So whereas before you had some of this capability with the uplink preferences feature, you could say I want FTP traffic to go up my backup internet so as not to clog up the primary, things like that. Now you'll be able to do that with VPN tunnels. So be able to really fully utilize all of your paths back to headquarters or a data center or a regional office or whatever the resource is that you need to access. Don't just use one path for it, right? Use any paths that are available, multiplex, balance across those, and add in the performance-based routing component where you can say if a certain path has high latency, high loss, high jitter, right, for VoIP, well, let's prefer a different path. Let's make those decisions dynamically. Let's adjust to the changing network conditions so that you always have the best secure path to the resource. And this is, as I said, coming in summer. Um, there's a lot of great work being done right now. We're working on some good marketing collateral with the IWAN teams that we'll make available. And the goal is to have, just as we do in general with the platform, the on-premises IWAN solution and the cloud-based IWAN solution, right? So I sort of jumped ahead of myself in the slides, but just to give you an idea to actually break down the, the actual changes to functionality, the first one is currently you can only do auto VPN over one uplink at a time. That's how the current functionality works, as, as some of you are probably aware. What we're going to be changing is that you'll be able to actually form two auto VPN tunnels, one over each uplink. Now, if you hypothetically were to have two MXs that each had two uplinks, you'd have four tunnels, right? Basically form a tunnel over every available path. And the reason for that is, again, if they're just tunnels, then we don't have to worry about the physical medium, we don't have to worry about the connection type, we can just treat them all sort of as unique paths that we can use in whatever way we like. So we'll be able to form these redundant tunnels. And then when we have to switch between them, it's just a routing change rather than forming an entire new VPN tunnel. And then of course, adding the policy-based routing where you can make, uh, at this time, layer three and layer four decisions about what type of traffic will take which path, and performance-based routing where you decide based on latency, jitter, and loss thresholds. So what is this valuable for? Well, there's three major deployment styles that we foresee being this useful for. As with all features, there are always some exciting use cases that are discovered after we release it that we hadn't even thought of. Um, CMX on the wireless is a great example of this, right? So we're gonna release this around these three major use cases and then we're gonna see what comes out of it because we suspect there will be more that'll pop up. But really the three major ones that we're looking at are DIA and MPLS, right? You have a standard internet line, you have an MPLS line. Well, let's allow you to bounce traffic between those, make routing decisions between those. Um, 
Internet standard DIA and 4G, right? 4G backup. Utilize the 4G backup if you want to, if you're not resource constrained on 4G, if you're not paying by the megabyte, right? And finally, just dual internet. For those customers that are either not using MPLS or want to shift away from MPLS in order to reduce cost, having that dual DIA pathing where you can really have the redundancy and the reliability and use both paths equally without the need for MPLS if it's not required and if it's not wanted in the deployment. So that's all I've got for you. I'll pass it back to Simon and he'll uh, finish us off. All right, thanks very much, Joe. And to all of our product managers, fantastic job once again. Uh, the dog has been gradually wandering around the room during the hour, but has managed not to distract us too badly. That's great news. I disagree. Uh, so we will come to some questions in a few moments. I just want to take uh, just a quick opportunity to remind you of great ways of keeping in touch with us. Hopefully you are all subscribed to our blog at this point in time. Uh, if you are not, you will, I'm sure, uh, find this useful. If you go to the blog, there is a a subscribe tool right at the top of the screen there just put in your email address and then you can just sit back and relax we will push the updates out to you and of course this is the first way in which we communicate any changes that we make uh, that is that's effectively our mouthpiece twitter account goes without saying and we also have now a growing and quite popular um, cisco cloud networking community uh, which you can head over and, and get engaged with there are quite a few people on there now uh, talking about meraki solutions and, uh, and uh, bringing up problems, helping each other out, and I think it's a really fantastic resource for growing there. So um, actually, just before we do q and I'm also just going to quickly remind you about the Meraki Challenge. Uh, I really hope that all of you have taken an opportunity to have a go at this, uh, because there are some great prizes here. We actually have the opportunity to win a smartwatch, which could be an Apple Watch, not the edition one, I don't think, but a uh, smartwatch from Apple or one of the Android smartwatches if you're an Android user. And if you're really lucky, you could find yourself on a tropical uh, tropical island enjoying a vacation there, all expenses paid. So that's from uh, for completing the Meraki Challenge. Uh, there's details on the screen here of how you can get to that web page if you've not done it already. It's effectively a race against time. So we want to see how quickly you can get through certain elements of the dashboard. We'll be timing you and we'll give you a little tiebreaker to put in and then you can get, uh, get engaged with that. So good luck and uh, let's get back to the questions. And I've got a few questions that have come in for the various different uh, products. We've got a few minutes left here, so we're okay for time. Uh, so starting off with the wireless, uh, there were a couple of questions came in around Bluetooth low energy, specifically around how we integrate that into the dashboard, uh, what kind of range we have on there, and the applications that, uh, that we could potentially be written to support the BLE capability. Uh, so just want to hand that one over to Matt to see if you've got any comments there. Those are great questions, Simon. Thank, thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> so let's start with the range, because that's an easy one. Um, Bluetooth is a very different, uh, Bluetooth low energy is a very different technology than wireless. Uh, and since uh, the primary use case is in the beaconing mode, that's where most, where most people's interests lay, um, it's, it's a very noise immune technology. So our general guidance is design your network for wireless. That's the primary need for the network. Design it for a wireless deployment, and you'll have complete Bluetooth coverage that comes with that layout. In truth, Bluetooth can transmit further than, than Wi-Fi in a lot of cases. Um, there may be use cases where you want to actually turn down the power of Bluetooth, but in general, design your network and the Bluetooth will come with it. BLE in the dashboard, right now there's two, uh, two primary ways to see BLE in the dashboard. One is configuring the beacon, turning on the beacon, and then setting up some of the uh, unique identifiers that you use to, uh, to specially define the identity of a particular beacon. It's very straightforward, a couple of text boxes in dashboard. And then the other view is for an entirely different use case, which we haven't even talked about, and that's uh, with asset tracking. So if you have the uh, little asset tags, which might previously have been Wi-Fi, but now you can use Bluetooth low energy asset tags, which have the benefits of being lower cost and much lower power, therefore longer lifetime, then those, those assets, those tags will be detected by the MR32 or MR72 access points, and they'll show up as a Bluetooth client in a Bluetooth client's list on the dashboard. So that, that pretty much sums up the, uh, the level of integration of the dashboard today. And, and then finally, the question of who writes the app. Um, so the great thing about Bluetooth is it's really simple, but the problem with Bluetooth is that it's so simple. Beacons are just so simple that it's hard for everybody to quickly get their minds around it. The app is written by the retailer or the customer who wants to deploy the beacons and then have them be used by the mobile app. 
it's not something that necessarily we would do. It's not something that Meraki would do. It's not something partners would do. It's something that the end customer is ultimately responsible for. Now we have a number of partners who specialize in mobile app development. They specialize in location aware applications and the types of user interaction that go with those. We're happy to offer those, those contacts and help you with those discussions. But uh, since the, the real interaction is not created by the network, the interaction is created by the app, it's up to the app developers, the person who's submitting that app to the app store, if you will, to write that app and create that capability. Perfect. Thanks very much, Matt. Yeah, I mean, I think Bluetooth is definitely a very exciting prospect. And it's the nice thing here is that you've got the ability to integrate Bluetooth beacons both from the Meraki AP side of things and then for more microcell use, there is obviously still the option of the traditional beacons you've probably seen already, the kind of ones you can stick under your desk uh, for providing more, more precise coverage. So that it's a really nice, uh, nice mixture. And of course, you've automatically got your APs up on the wall. So why not make use of it for that, for that new uh, opportunity? So we also had quite a few questions come in, not surprisingly at all, for Paul on Systems Manager. Yeah. Uh, so let's just walk through those quickly. If we are using less than 100 users uh, on a previous Systems Manager installation, so we had 100 clients or less uh, up on previous, previous to the, uh, the announcement we just made, what actually happens to those users and those accounts? Great question, and obviously saving the best for second, like you do. Um, so to answer that directly, um, if you are a Systems Manager standard customer and you have under 100 devices, um, we've actually made it very easy for you to move over to the new model. If you navigate to the Organization License Info page or Upgrade page if you have no licensing on there, then we actually just have an upgrade button that you can click there. It's gonna move you over to Systems Manager Enterprise. You get all the new functionality. Uh, you do have to confirm what happens there. Uh, you can't move back to standard after you do that. Um, and you do have the 100 device limit, but that, that is our way of providing all of that functionality. You can do it yourself. Our customers can go on there, click the button and upgrade and you get moved over. Uh, like I stated a, a little bit before though, our Major thing that we wanted to do was make it so that automatically nothing happened to standard customers by default unless you want it to. So we have all these routes where you can do things if you want that to happen. Perfect. Uh, we also had a few quite specific questions around uh, syncing of files uh, using the, the Systems Manager tool. Uh, email segregation, are we able to handle any of that stuff? And can we prevent users from changing their passwords? Yeah, great question. So uh, we have this uh, feature and dashboard called Backpack. And that allows us to upload files. You can actually add in um, the URL for publicly hosted files that you have. You can add a bunch of those and then by grouping devices, you can say these kinds of devices are supposed to get all of these files. That could be stuff like getting started guides, uh, like new hire training. It could be network topologies, PowerPoints, presentations. It could be books, things that students are going to use. And this is your way of adding all your, all your files up uh, so that we can push these out to all your end users. And then what we do is we give you options to do things like automatically download them. This is something like maybe an Android enterprise app like an APK. You can say automatically install this. You can also say keep up to date. So this not only will automatically download, but it'll actually sync the files if there's a new version that we detect that you've, uh, you've added, then we can push that down. And again, that is a feature that we call Backpack. So that's on your MDM settings page. The other question we have is about email uh, separation. I believe that's what that says. Simon's handwriting is not amazing. <laughs> okay, <I'll> segregation. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, absolutely. So what we do is we um, take advantage of this feature called Open End Management, for example. And what this does is this makes it so that we can actually separate all corporate and private data. So what this means is anything that's managed from Systems Manager, anything we push down, like for your iPad or your iPhone, for example, if we push down email settings, we push out a few enterprise apps, Wi-Fi, whatever we push down to the device is inherently just separated from the private data. And uh, you can also say that they can't talk to each other. So example, let's say you have an email attachment in your corporate email. You cannot open up that attachment in your personal Gmail or you couldn't open it up in your private Dropbox app uh, and vice versa or something of the sort there. All right, perfect. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, so one for Lawrence, uh, quite an easy one, this one, topology. 
Uh, does the topology capability cover all of our technology or is it only on the switches? Yeah, that's fantastic. So like I said before, the key foundation uh, for the topology feature relies on uh, a lot of the data that the uh, Meraki switches can see. So when you actually think about the network topology that's built out, it will show all the Cisco Meraki devices, including MX security appliances, the switches, and our access points. So one of the very powerful use cases here is in a troubleshooting scenario, you can easily identify in dashboard uh, a specific client, and you can see how it's connected to, whether it's through an AP, through a switch, and trace that path all the way back up to uh, the MX and beyond. Now, if there are third-party devices, or non-Cisco Meraki devices, uh, those are directly connected to Cisco Meraki switches, uh, like Catalyst, for example. If they have CDP or LDP data, uh, they will be represented by a diamond shape in the topology view. And you can see uh, whatever type of information is embedded in that CDP or LDP information. Perfect. It's good to know we can cover not just Meraki equipment there as well. Uh, so a couple of questions for Joe on the MX side of things. Uh, do we have support for uh, dynamic routing protocols and which ones are we covering at this point in time? Which ones are we thinking about? Uh, also, we've had questions about uh, roaming on the wireless and potential meshing. That's good to be aware of. Um, LTE support on the uh, on the uh, USB dongle you can use for, for uh, backup there. And also, how many tunnels can we support? With, what about a sizing guide or something? So I'm going to go ahead and mix the order up a little bit to cover the easy one first. Um, no plans for roaming in terms of, or rather for meshing between the MXW units and the MRs. Um, you can do roaming today, but there's no kind of, you know, 802.11 RRK. There's really no fast roaming technologies involved. The MXW series is designed to be for a small branch where that's the only wireless you need. Uh, and I know that's not the answer everyone wants to get because an MXW is usually cheaper than an MX without wireless and an MR together. But at the end of the day, if you need more than one access point for that location, the goal is you'll get, let's say, an MX64 and then access points rather than MX64W. The 64W should be purchased primarily when it's the only wireless you need for that particular site. Um, on the dynamic routing side, we have a limited OSPF capability today. Uh, you can read about it on the docs.meraki.com page under the site site VPN section for MX. And basically what it allows you to do is advertise your routes for all of the branches, the VPN connected branches through OSPF from your data center concentrator so that you don't have to create a bunch of static routes in the data center. So we have that limited advertise only capability today. Uh, we don't have full OSPF, we don't have any other routing protocols, but we are working to add OSPF. Um, and after OSPF, the next one would likely be BGP. Uh, for those who I'm sure are wondering, we are thinking about EIGRP, but at this point it's still a bit of a pipe dream just because the open source community has only had so long to play with it. Uh, we've talked to some of the other internal Cisco teams about flavors of it that we may be able to implement, but we feel that really OSPF is the, the really pressing need. Uh, and after that, we're going to dig into BGP and then we'll go from there. On the cellular modem side, we do have uh, a list of modems supported again, actually on the docs.meraki.com page. You can go there and see what modems we support today on both MX and Z1 units. Um, there is a, a pretty decent list of modems there. It's, it's quite a large list. The international options uh, are also listed based on the region that they support. In the U.S., it's pretty much all major carriers. Uh, internationally, most of the modems are carrier agnostic, so you can pretty much use them anywhere. Um, so do check out that list, and if you have specific questions about it, feel free to reach out to your system or IP rep. They'll put you in touch with you know, a systems engineer or potentially escalate to me if they need to and get those questions answered, and we're, we're happy to address that. I saved the best one for last. So the sizing guide, I'll be totally honest with you, the, the tunnel counts in the sizing guide uh, need to be revised. And that's something I actually was working with a couple of partners on yesterday uh, because of the fact that when we first built the sizing guide, the idea for the tunnel count was based on the number of peers in the VPN topology. And we made a mistaken assumption there. We, we kind of assumed that each peer, let's say each branch, would have one or two subnets in it. The problem is, if you do it purely based on the number of tunnels, and each of those tunnels includes 20 subnets, and we're now getting customers who are doing that sort of thing, um, really, the number of tunnels is not what matters in terms of resource scaling and resource usage. What matters is how many security associations, how many routes are involved, all this. So having 10 tunnels with two subnets each is very different from having 10 tunnels with 20 subnets each. So we're gonna be retuning those numbers, but in the time being, it's safe to assume that the number of tunnels listed in the sizing guide is based on the number of security associations. So the number of VPN included subnets rather than the total number of peers. 
Um, and like I said, we will be retuning those numbers. And again, if you have specific questions, the best thing to do is reach out to your rep. And I've been talking to our systems engineering team about this. Um, you know, they know what's going on with this and they can kind of help you tune in what is the right MX for your deployment, what can we do to make those numbers match, right? All that good stuff. Fantastic. Thank you very much, all of you, for those questions. Uh, there are a couple of generic ones which I will take myself. Uh, so we have a question around uh, detailed reporting. So obviously, the dashboard does provide you with an event log. Uh, you also have the ability to set up uh, time-based reporting, which can get quite deep as well. So you can get into tag-based reporting. So you could look at a specific floor, building, site, that kind of thing. And these can be automatically sent to you in your email as well. So there's no need for you to actually go to dashboard to actually manually pull those out. If you do want to get a more granular detail, we do have syslog capability built in across the portfolio. Uh, so do have a look at that. You can output far more detail if you want to record and look at that in, in further detail. As far as Prime is concerned, we had a question on Prime. A device pack has recently been launched for uh, incorporating Meraki uh, view management into, uh, into the Prime database. It's not designed for, uh, for actually configuration changes. That's always going to be the dashboard. Uh, but at least now with Prime, if you have a multi-vendor multi, multi uh, vendor, uh, deployment or you have traditional Cisco as well as the uh, Meraki uh, equipment out there, then you're going to be able to see them both in the same view and see if you're getting any issues with any of that equipment. So that's a really nice step forward in terms of integration. And then finally, we had a question around um, beta testing. We often get asked this, can we get early access to the features? Um, as you may have noticed, if you look on dashboard, there are a number of places where you will see the word beta. Uh, or beta, as I think you say here in the US. There it is. Uh, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> we got that. and obviously, this is the way in which we actually do this with you guys. So when we have a new feature to, uh, to get out there, generally speaking, it's put out in beta so that you can try it out, make sure it's working correctly. And that's when we announce it in the blog, which is another good reason to be subscribed to that. Okay, so it looks like we're going to be able to give you five minutes of your time back. I'd just like to thank you very much indeed for joining us again today. Um, as you can see on the screen there, I'm very happy to receive any of your feedback for the quarterly. We want to make sure this is a really valuable session for you. I think once a quarter is a nice cadence to keep you updated on what's new with us. But obviously in between that, the blog's the place to do that. So from all the PMs and myself, uh, let's all say cheerio and we'll see you again next quarter. Cheerio. 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 Goodbye.